Hello. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Good. Yes. Thank you so much for um, interviewing me, Laura. I'm a oh. mega fan. So this is this is a real moment for me. <laughs> I am a mega fan. And I just um, I am so excited to talk about the Paris apartment today. Um, I just wanted to start by introducing myself, introducing you. Um, I'm Laura Dave, author of The Last Thing He Told Me. And I cannot believe that I have the great good fortune to talk with Lucy Foley today, who has written three of my favorite novels among her novels, um, The Guest List, which I read first, um, then The Hunting Game, The Hunting Game, The Hunting Game, The Hunting Party, The Hunting Party, The Hunting Party. The hunting party, the hunting party. Oh, I, to be honest, I get it wrong. Okay, okay. <laughs> the Hunting Party, and it's then the, the, the Paris Apartment, and I do have to say that um, I pre-ordered this like maybe eight months ago before I even knew I was doing this event and my joy when I was asked to do the event and this is 100% true it's like absolutely the only thing I request is that I get an early copy so I can prepare because I just wanted an early copy of your book any excuse <laughs> to get it and um we have so many great questions and I have so many great questions for you today but I do feel that I just need to tell this um very excited audience and I'm going to get to all of your questions um for those of you who haven't read the book yet, I can say as a mega Lucy Foley fan, I truly believe this is her best book yet. I could not put it down. So um, I know that many of you have ordered the book and Barnes and Noble is gonna let you know it's on its way to you. Um, and if so, if you haven't had the chance to start turning the pages yet, I can guarantee you that if you loved her earlier books, this is in my mind, her best one, which is saying a lot. So um, anyway, I am so excited to be here and I'm going to just jump right in um, with some questions. I will say that one of the things I love so much about this is it Paris, which is a city so close to my heart, it just leapt off the page from the first, from its, um, from your first page. And I wanted to know what inspired you to write about a creepy apartment building in Paris and a missing brother? Um, did you take any research trips to Paris? How did this all start for you? Well, funny enough, um, the setting for the book kind of fell into my lap. So the whole kind of this, this apartment building. So I was, uh, working actually on a draft of uh, the guest list um, and I like to what I like to do is kind of take myself in a little sort of solo like writing retreat and book a sort of cheap Airbnb somewhere and sort of go away and, and like just free from like home distractions like laundry and all of that and um, and I'd done that I'd gone to Paris um, because I thought how how wonderful I can sort of wander around and you know kind of be inspired while while I'm not writing um, and this apartment building was just wonderfully creepy. Um, it sort of it had this sort of spiral staircase and the lights would go off at weird times and you sort of be plunged into darkness. And I could hear all these kind of strange noises from the apartment up above me. And it had this sort of central courtyard and you could sort of slightly see into everyone else's apartments, which sounds sort of really creepy and voyeuristic of me. But um, <laughs> as a writer, I think I just thought there is a story to be told about this apartment building and I want to be the one to tell it. Um, and I think kind of simultaneously with that, I had this idea that I wanted to write this kind of missing boy book. So this kind of missing, like flip, flip the kind of missing girl trope on its head a little bit. I wanted a, a sister looking for her brother. Um, and so I kind of, the two ideas sort of converged. Oh, wow, that's so interesting. Because you can really, you really feel Paris here. You know, it, um, you just, you, you feel that building. It's just so, it's, it's so well done. So it's just so interesting. Um, and I do think also like, you know, the idea of a locked room thriller, which you just do so well in all of your books. Um, what do you think is the appeal of it? Like, what is the appeal for you for writing it? And do you think that there's a new appeal for reading it because of our current world? How does that, how does that factor in for you? Yes, yeah, so I guess as a, as a writer, there's something really fun about sort of ring fencing your characters and kind of putting them under 
a microscope and sort of turning the heat up a little bit. There's a lot of weird metaphors all kind of <laughs> um, <laughs> thrown together there. So that'd be terrible writing. Um, but uh, I think it's that, I think it's that focus on this cast of characters and getting the, the reader to kind of look really closely at the kind of relationships between them and the way they interact with each other. Um, obviously, in the first two books, I had cast of characters that were literally isolated from the rest of the world. So it was like their environment kind of brought out something within them. You know, it was like it was like that those sort of events could never have happened um, if they hadn't gone to this sort of isolated location and been cut off and had no connectivity. And I kind of wanted to find a new way of doing that in the Paris apartment, because obviously, it's in the middle of a massive capital city in it and it's surrounded by kind of people and bars and all of that but um i wanted to kind of cut jess my sort of protagonist off in different ways um you know she doesn't speak the language which kind of always fascinates me as a sort of premise for a thriller you know people can be having conversations around you and you don't actually know what they're saying um uh, but also kind of play with this sort of gothic thing of the apartment building itself so that whilst it's in this sort of buzzing metropolitan city when you close that front gate it sort of feels like the rest of the world doesn't really exist and you've kind of been swallowed whole by this building yeah yeah that's so that's so interesting and you know it's so funny because um I was somewhat from I mean this is going to sound so crazy um and I'm in it but it's such a compliment to you which is when I started reading your books and I, I started with the guest list list that was my first one um and then I went back and now I'm caught up with this one um with these three but um I wasn't I knew Agatha Christie of course but I hadn't read so many of her books and you're often called a modern day Agatha Christie and it made me want to go back and read you know Agatha Christie um and so you've and I know you've I've heard you cited cited um as a, as a modern day Agatha Christie and you've cited her as an inspiration for your thrillers I was I'm just wondering what drew you to Christie and how does she influenced your your work. Yeah, I mean, first of all, that comparison is amazing and I don't feel worthy of it, but I will take it because it's just <laughs> lovely. Um, but I mean, I kind of, if I'm sort of stuck when I'm plotting particularly, I kind of think, what would Agatha do? And kind of try and summon the spirit of Agatha because she was just like, there are no flies on her at all when it comes to her plotting. And she is just, she was just the kind of, grand arm of the the kind of golden age murder mystery and I I just really wanted to kind of explore that in a modern setting but you know I've kind of read so many of her books several times over and I kind of find new things to sort of admire each time so I think when I first read, read Agatha Christie I was uh, quite young probably too young um and <laughs> to read murders murder mysteries and uh and you know I just enjoyed them for that kind of puzzle solving element you know it's like this kind of puzzle box and you know what's the solution and trying to guess and I think um as I got older and kind of reread them it was sort of realizing how dark they are there's so much darkness there and I think they can feel cozy because obviously they feel quite kind of vintage and they're sort of set in this kind of past era, but actually there's some really like bleak and brutal stuff in them, which I'm kind of drawn to, the evil part of me. Um, <laughs> um, but, but mainly just, you know, the plotting, like if you look at a book like, and then there were none, it's got no fat on it whatsoever. She like very quickly introduces this quite large cast of characters mm -hmm. um, and you know exactly who they are. They're very distinct you kind of, you're immediately suspicious of all of them and kind of um, intrigued by all of them. And, and I just think that's fabulous. Oh, that's great. And so that also speaks, so she's definitely an inspiration for you. And while you're writing, what else inspires you? Do you watch movies or read books similar in theme? What's your writing process like? I mean, hugely inspired by film, I think. Um, yeah. Kind of old films, current films, um, this book, you know, I, I have to say, like, I was hugely inspired by Rear Window. It's like my favorite. Oh, yeah. just, I watched that film so many times. Um, it's just got this wonderful atmosphere. And I just think that kind of that voyeuristic theme, you know, kind of other people's lives, that sort of thing of living in a city cheek by jowl with other people and wondering about them, these strangers, you know, you don't know anything about their, their lives, but you sort of see little snippets of them and you can kind of in the way that we do as writers almost create narratives about the people kind of living around you 
Um, so that was a huge inspiration. Uh, the Tenant and uh, was another big cinematic inspiration. That's obviously set in a massively creepy prison apartment. Yeah. Um, uh, also, things like, to be honest, um, uh, there's a wonderful film with Audrey Hepburn, which has now completely gone out of my head. Um, Charade set in oh. Paris she's sort of this kind of plucky heroine and I think that kind of fed into fed into my idea of Jess sort of alone in the city um uh another book that was then made into a film um was The Wheel Spins which was made into a Hitchcock film called The Lady Vanishes um mm. and that really inspired that thing of kind of not being able to speak the language and knowing that there are probably these conversations going on around you that you're deeply suspicious of but just having that real sort of, um, you know, you're kind of isolated by your inability to understand what's being said. Um, it's this wonderful book, it's set on a kind of train hurtling across Europe in the 1930s, it's really glamorous. It's like such a page turning thriller. Um, it's sort of the original girl on the train in some ways. Um, oh. uh, it's just wonderful. So, oh wow, that's yeah. so interesting. Um, and. I have a couple more questions and then um, I promise I'm going to get to everyone else's and I, I, these are my last two, but I just had to know two more things. One is how does your background in publishing, do you think influence your writing? Because you, yeah, and you tell everyone, um, there's been a couple of questions I'll get you and people are interested about how you started mm -hmm. writing. So, you know, that might speak to that a little bit. Mm, definitely. Um, well, I think I wasn't really a writer. I didn't, ever think of myself as a writer before um, I started working in the publishing industry. I very much thought of myself as a kind of voracious reader. Um, I really came to writing from reading. Um, I just wanted to do something that would let me work with books. So I uh, did English Lit at university. Um, I then worked, tried to get a foot in the door in the publishing industry, worked in um, Waterstones, which is like oh, our lucky, biggest yeah. branch in the UK for a long time. Um, uh, so worked there, worked as a literary agent's assistant, like um, actually I was kind of receptionist. So I'd sort of answer the door to people, but at the same time I got to kind of read what we called the slush pile, which is all the unsolicited manuscripts. And um, I just couldn't believe that I had this sort of, I was allowed to kind of read these manuscripts coming in and these worlds that people had created. That was just wonderful. And then got into um, uh, a publisher, worked as a fiction editor. And I think it was just, being surrounded by stories and people talking about stories. It was like kind of pinch me moment. It was like, I can't believe this is my work. This is what I do for a living. Like people are literally just talking about kind of made up worlds and narratives and characters. And it's sort of so inspiring. Um, so it was that. And I think also the fact that, you know, working as an editor, I saw manuscripts come in at every stage of the publishing process. Um, and you kind of realize you know, the book doesn't start out perfect. It, it needs yeah. a lot of work. And I think that that sort of took some of the, the kind of fear and mystique away from it. And I just thought, you know, I'm going to have a go, um, mm. see what happens. Um, so that was sort of how I got started. I think that's, I think that's so important also for people who want to write to, to think about that first drafts are first drafts for all of us. They never start out fabulous or perfect or anything well, like that. Definitely don't. <laughs> <laughs> and taking that, taking that away, it's, you know, each book in a way is starting again for, for everybody. Um, I have a request um, uh, that just came up on the chat for you to read something, if you'd be interested in that. And um, I'm gonna ask one last question. Maybe you could think about whether you wanna read something, oh, which goodness. is, yeah. you know, in terms of, um, in terms of how it's almost starting over every time, I almost feel like the one thing that um, I carry with me in every book is wanting to feel like I am um, exciting my readers. Um, and, you know, we've both found this new readership with Reese's book club and her voracious readers. And I was wondering, how was that experience with the guest list? How did that change things for you? Oh, I mean, just completely nuts. It was, Incredible. I remember, um, because this is a wonderful thing about obviously being in Europe. And so any emails from the US, I often see kind of when I wake up the next morning and I'm sort of scrolling through, you know, my phone, I just saw this email from my editor um, saying, Reese is calling the subject line. <laughs> I was like, the Reese, you know, the, the Reese Witherspoon. And it was just kind of from then on, like this unbelievable experience. Um, and just so exciting to kind of 
be, be in touch with so many new readers through that um, and, and kind of readers across the pond, across the Atlantic. It was just like a totally thrilling, mad journey. I don't know if you found the same. It's still, it's very, it's, it, you mentioned earlier, like a pinch me moment. And that's certainly, I totally. think. Yeah. Um, and now for those who haven't gotten their book yet, would you mind doing a, a reading? Well, do you know, this is actually, Actually, I may like trip over myself because this is literally the first reading I've done from the book. So, Ooh, um, so the moment. Um, uh, I think I'm just going to start with the very beginning um, because um, it sort of, it, it opens the story, I guess. So, it's such a great opening. It's so oh, great. Thank so, you. Thank uh, you. <laughs> um, ben, his fingers hover over the keyboard. Got to get it all down. This, this is the story that's going to make his name. Ben lights another cigarette, a gitane. Bit of a cliche to smoke them here, but he does actually like the taste. And fine, yeah, likes the way he looks smoking them too. He's sitting in front of the apartment's long windows, which look onto the central courtyard. Everything out there is steeped in darkness, save for the weak greenish glow thrown by a single lamp. It's a beautiful building, but there's something rotten at its heart. Now he's discovered it, he can smell the stench of it everywhere. He should be clearing out of here soon. He's outstayed his welcome in this place. Jess could hardly have chosen a worse time to come and stay. She barely gave him any notice and she didn't give much detail on the phone, but clearly something's up, something wrong with whatever crappy bar job she's working now. His half sister has a knack for turning up when she's not wanted. She's like a homing beacon for trouble. It seems to follow her around. She's never been good at just playing the game, never understood how much easier it makes life if you just give people what they want tell them what they want to hear. He did tell her to come and stay whenever you like, but he didn't really mean it. Trust Jess to take him at his word. When was the last time he saw her? Thinking about her always makes him feel guilty. Should he have been there for her more, looked out for her? She's fragile, Jess. Or not fragile exactly, but vulnerable in a way people probably don't see at first. Anyway, he should call her, give her some directions. When her phone rings out, he leaves a voice note. Hey Jess, so it's number 12, Ruda, Ruda Mant. That's a terrible pronunciation, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> got that, third floor. His eyes drawn to a flash of movement in the courtyard beneath the windows. Someone's passing through it quickly, almost running. He can only make out a shadowy figure, can't see who it is. But something about the speed seems odd. He's hit with a little animal spike of adrenaline. He remembers he's still recording the voice note, drags his gaze from the window. Just ring the buzzer. I'll be up waiting for you. He stops, hesitates, listens, a noise. The sound of footsteps out on the landing, approaching the apartment door. The footsteps stop. Someone is there just outside. He waits for a knock, none comes. Silence, but a weighted silence, like a held breath, odd. And then another sound. He stands still, ears pricked, listening intently. There it is again. It's metal on metal, the scrape of a key, then the clunk of it entering the mechanism. He watches the lock turn. Someone is unlocking his door from the outside someone who has a key, but no business coming in here uninvited. The handle begins to move downward. The door begins to open with that familiar drawn out groan. He puts his phone down on the kitchen counter, voice note forgotten, waits and watches dumbly as the door swings forward, as the figure steps into the room. What are you doing here? He asks, calm, reasonable, nothing to hide, not afraid, or not yet. And why? Then he sees what his intruder holds. Now, now the fear comes. <laughs> I, I muted myself so that uh, just in case that I, there was any background noise, but um, my young child heard your voice and was like, what's that? And I'm like, go away, go away. <laughs> I apologize if anyone saw me being like, mm. That's brilliant. <laughs> that was um that you was come and join. 
<laughs> um, but anyway, that was really I also love that I stopped myself and I was like, that's terrible pronunciation because I literally, I live in Belgium at the moment and that is like my experience here. So I do speak a bit of French, but like my basic experience every day is going out and kind of trying to make myself understood, a bit like Jess <laughs> and people being like, why are you butchering our language? <laughs> you know, it's horrible. <laughs> Well, I, I thought we would, we would switch. We have so, you know, Barnes Noble got so many great questions for you. I have like 20 more, but I'm going to switch over to some, uh, some of these questions. Um, and one of them that I think is so, was such a smart question is, um, how do you determine, because one of the things that's so great about your books is there are red herrings and yet nothing ends up, and, and, and it's impossible to predict, but nothing ends up feeling like it was not seated well, if that makes sense. Like, in other words, it's not, it's, you, you really walk that, that great line between surprising and yet inevitable. And so the question that we got from a reader was, how do you determine the line between too many twists and terms and it being just enough to keep readers guessing? Which is such a great question. That is such a great question. Um, I don't know what you find, Laura, but I think it's it feels like it's a sort of question of kind of layering and it's something that kind of happens across several drafts. Um, and, you know, obviously at the, the beginning, maybe you've got kind of ideas for your kind of major twists or some great twists, but things come to you. Well, certainly with me, they come to me when I'm writing. I try and plot really carefully, but that doesn't always work and, and and sort of things you suddenly realize well that would be a really exciting thing to kind of add in and and that and there's a point at which you're kind of you're so inside the story that it feels like ideas are come like pinging pinging towards you from all angles and and you kind of want to put everything in but you kind of have to hold yourself back a little bit um and so it really is a question of sort of I think of it as kind of like a scales like how much do you kind of put mm -hmm. on the scales before you kind of tip the balance to it feeling too much um or actually um uh how many clues do you give the reader before you kind of tip the scales into them guessing at the wrong point um so it's all this kind of refining and refining and layering across drafts um and then to be honest having some really trusted readers so That'll be kind of my husband, my editor, a couple of friends I have as kind of beta readers who I trust to be really honest with me. Um, <laughs> you also get this point at which um, those readers have kind of lost their innocence. So it becomes like more and more difficult for them to tell you when they read like a, a net, the next draft. Um, so you then have to kind of find other trusted readers. Um, so it's a sort of complex process, but it definitely doesn't just involve me and it definitely doesn't um, get nailed in that first draft. <laughs> Well to, well, to that end, in terms of this specific books, uh, we got another question, which is, what is the hardest challenge you came up against writing The Paris Apartment? Really great question. Um, I think there are a couple. So I think the first one was setting it in a city um, because I really wanted to kind of have my cake and eat it. So I wanted to have this sort of closed circle murder mystery feeling to it and this kind of gothic sort of enclosed feeling but I also wanted Paris to be in it and I wanted to kind of have I mean especially because I was sort of writing it in kind of first lockdown 2020 I was like I was so drawn to kind of writing about crowded bars and streets and metro carriages and all of that kind of people rubbing up against each other and that sounds weird but you know um and so and that was probably the challenge kind of balancing the two um and making Jess feel isolated um without it feeling too sort of um kind of shoehorned you know um but hopefully hopefully I found the balance and it was and it was a really fun challenge I think that's often the thing with writing the, the things that are the most challenging and the most satisfying um when when you kind of finally get to the point where you're like okay I think I got yeah. there um so so that was the kind of first big challenge um and then probably the second one was actually having a character so so Ben who um, the, the the intro is kind of from his point of view, but in third person, all of the other points of view are first person, um, was probably creating this character that you only ever really see from other people's points of view. Um, so you kind of get this composite idea of who he is, um, but he's many different things to many different people and they all have their own kind of versions of him. Um, and also they're kind of unreliable narrators. And so they have unreliable kind of visions of him. Um, 
almost like a kind of talented Mr. Ripley-esque figure. That was sort of what I was aiming for. Um, again, that was a big challenge, but it was also a lot of fun to do. Yeah. Well, so that's, that um, goes very naturally into another reader's question, which is, do you tend to write one character's POV all the way through before moving to another? Or do your character, um, uh, or do you write your characters in order as they appear? And do you end up moving characters around much? Like where they're, you know, here we have all these interesting stories. Like, do you end up, you know, almost like index cards moving them around? Totally. So I, I very much um, hop between points of view, depending on who I'm feeling like writing that day. I think it's a really fun thing to, if you've got lots of points of view to write from as a writer, to sort of, to be able to do that. Um, you know, it keeps things feeling really fresh. Um, I like sort of handing the conch over to kind of my next narrator, as it were. Um, so I love kind of doing that. I'm sort of greedy. I like hopping between people's heads and points of view. Um, and yes, there is so much kind of moving around of the different parts and the kind of trying, trying the puzzle, you know, in different kind of formulations and seeing how that works and trying to work out because obviously it's chronological as well. So like, is that in the right place? Or actually has that thing happened before? And um, so that's a real headache, but again, kind of deeply satisfying. Um, I have this wonderful bit of software that kind of lets me move, like almost modulize those scenes and kind of move them around, which helps a bit, but yeah, it's a headache. Do you, so you, do you always know who did it or what this at the beginning when you go in, do you know what, who, do you know the end at the beginning is another question. No. Well, I always think, I, I sort of think I do because if I don't have an idea of the ending, I feel like a bit nervous about starting. Right. But the ending always changes. So in all three thrillers, the identity of the murderer has changed. Um, and it's sort of, it's really weird. It's sort of with all three, it's been about a third of the way into writing. And I think that's perhaps the point as a writer where you kind of, you kind of feel like things things have their own momentum and you're sort of moving along and the characters are almost kind of powering the story for you. Um, and that's the point at which I suddenly realized, oh no, it'd be so much more exciting to kind of do it this way um, and have this person do it. Um, and the kind of, one of the biggest twists, um, oh, don't want to spoil anything, um, but one of the biggest twists came to me kind of about halfway through writing. And it was just so, like, those moments are so exciting as a writer, I think. Yeah. When it feels like they're, they're starting to talk to you in that totally. weird way. And then you're very like, strange. Yeah. Very, um, I, I love, I love what um, that answer, uh, particularly the idea that you're writing toward an ending, but you kind of even know that's not gonna end up being the ending even as you're going. Um, uh, and then uh, we have another question. Uh, there's also so many good questions coming in um, and people are comparing this book to Rosemary's Baby, uh, which is really nice. Um, Actually, that was a huge inspiration. I should have mentioned that as well. Yes, it really was. Yeah, that kind of gothic apartment building just, oh. Oh, fabulous. And, and um, two different readers wanted to know, what is your biggest inspiration for writing your characters? Do you base them on people you know? Uh, <laughs> where do they come from? Um, really interesting question. I don't knowingly base them on anyone I know. Um, and I should definitely say that, um, especially as I write, definitely a lot of characters you kind of love to hate as the reader, um, the, the, the kind of less likable end of the scale. Um, I suppose, I always think that they've sort of come to me, they feel like they've come to me kind of fully formed um, or, or kind of introduce themselves to me and then I sort of um, uncover who they really are. But I think they probably are kind of, as they probably are aspects of people I've met or people I've sort of seen from afar, maybe just in a coffee shop or a bar or sort of on a plane or whatever. Um, and, and probably little bits of myself as well. I think there are kind of elements um, of, of, of ourselves as writer and our characters, um, even those characters we sort of kind of dislike. Um, but I think hopefully that helps. You know, what I want with all my characters is even if they're sort of unlikable characters um, at times is for the reader to feel sort of some empathy with them and some kind of understanding of what drives them. Um, because obviously everyone is the hero of their own tale. Yes. Um, and there are no kind of cardboard cutout bad mm -hmm. guys. Um, uh, so, so really to, to be able to kind of find that sort of human fellow feeling with them, because I don't think it's interesting, you know, seeing, seeing someone's point of view otherwise. Yeah. 
Well, that that um, that's really interesting, and that makes me wonder. Um, that's really interesting. I love we, everyone's the hero of their own tale. Thinking about that, um, and because also then you know, even as a writer, then you get to enjoy telling all of those stories. Um, and then, which leads to a question we got from a woman named Jenny, which is, which of your own books? did you enjoy writing the most? Um, and then the second part of that question, which is from somebody else, but it feels uh, very related is which novel have you been the most proud of? Are those two different novels or? So, you know what, funnily enough, I think I would say this book for both of those. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, it was a weird writing process for this book. So uh, I started writing it in kind of 2020 um, lockdown and I was pregnant and um, it was sort of a slightly, I mean, it was a frightening time for everyone. It was a frightening time to be pregnant. Um, uh, I was lucky and I was, you know, able to kind of isolate and all of that as a writer, but it was a weird time to be writing, but I could sort of escape into this, into this other world and, and travel on the page, which I think is the wonderful, you know, luxury we have as readers and writers. Um, but uh, what I suddenly realized was that this book was not going to be finished before, or this book was not going to be delivered before the baby was delivered. Um, oh. so I sort of had to come to this realization and tell my editors that and uh, kind of acknowledge that. And I then went away for six months um, and looked after my baby and didn't work on the book at all. But I think it was sort of percolating the whole time and was sort of there in my subconscious. And I was really nervous about coming back to it. Um, and would it feel the same? Would my brain work in the same way? But actually it was just this wonderful experience coming back to my desk and sort of, reuniting myself with all these characters and they sort of felt more clear to me in some ways their voices um and especially Jess um and it was just such fun just really enjoyed it um and I think I feel proudest of it for that reason as well um it was sort of a, a more difficult kind of um uh broken up sort of writing experience than I would normally get I kind of realized on the other side of having a baby I, was like, I had so much time before like what yeah. was I thinking you know no, I'm so funny. naive um what did I spend my days doing um <laughs> but it was it was kind of really rewarding for that well that you know that's uh that's really that's I, I really like that I, I sometimes also <laughs> think um, a, you know, a baby is a wonderful reason to be forced to take a break. But whenever you take a break, what you bring back at the end, you know, it's almost like we should all be forced to take a break in, in, in some way. Um, uh, and which is, which is, you know, advice that I would give, which is put, if you, when you think you're done, put it down, then Absolutely. pick it back up. Um, and Absolutely. then we got, which leads to another question, which is, um, if you could give your younger writing self one piece of advice, um, this is from a reader named Robin, uh, if you could give your younger writing self one piece of advice, what would that be? Really great question. I think probably, um, don't worry, and I still have to tell myself this now, so this is still a piece of advice I give myself, don't worry too much about getting it right. I think I still have such imposter syndrome as a writer. I'm like, I, you know, every time I kind of get up and do a panel with other writers, I sort of hear about their process. I'm like, I'm doing it all wrong. Like, you know, I'm not a proper writer. I'm sort of really disorganized and kind of really wasteful as well. I feel like I write a lot and, and have to get rid of a lot, like kill a lot of darlings. Um, but that is just my process. That's the way I work and that's fine. Um, I've kind of made my peace with that. And actually I, I heard this wonderful analogy. I think it was Maggie O'Farrell, the author that said, um, all that kind of extra stuff that you write that sort of hits the cutting room floor is kind of like scaffolding that's surrounding this beautiful, hopefully beautiful um, kind of central building that you've created this this central kind of edifice um, and you you need all of that to support it even if you kind of ultimately get rid of it so so that made me feel a lot better about it um, <laughs> but it but it also I think I know now having kind of I'm writing my seventh book now um you know I'm aware that um every time it feels new and it feels difficult it, I think you said this at the beginning and it's like kind of, you think it's going to get easier and it doesn't but that's fine you know and, and I tell myself, I've done it before, I could do it, I could do it again. <laughs> That's great. Um, uh, wait, hold on one second, just because it... Uh, 
Hi, I'm so sorry. I just, I don't want any, your, 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 uh, your child, you seem more, more managed. So I was just trying to say, please, I can hear voices. Um, uh, but so. I went to an event with my son literally sitting on my lap. So it was just like the top of his head because <laughs> he woke up, he was meant to be sleeping and he woke up and I just had to have him there with like an apple. Anyway, sorry, oh, I digress. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, but the, I, I, I do want to ask this too, which is all of your books feel like they could be television shows or films and one of the readers was wondering um which of your books would you most like to see adapted and can we look forward to seeing any adapted oh well oh my goodness any of them i'd be so happy to have any of them adapted um uh it would just be such a thrill and i think also i'm such a fan of kind of film and TV and um, I'm fascinated by screenwriting as well. I download scripts and kind of just read them. I'm kind of real screenwriting geek and would love to do it myself one day. Um, and so I would love to see what a screenwriter would do with one of the books and kind of the new directions in which they take it and the way they sort of crack open that world. Um, so the exciting thing is all three thrillers um, are kind of in the works. Um, I don't know if I can say any more about the Paris apartment um, without out, kind of blowing the little things but um yeah it's, it's all exciting exciting times oh that's so exciting well in in other spoiler um related questions don't worry not specific to this book um several readers are wondering if you can tell us anything about what you're working on next definitely so it's still quite it's in that kind of very early kind of nebulous phase um but uh i would kind of describe it as sort of Miss Marple meets the Wicker Man meets kind of Soho Farmhouse sort of thing. Um, it's all about kind of us and them, like small village and the kind of outsiders coming in from big city. And um, I'm having such fun with it. Um, and I'm kind of getting into some sort of local kind of pagan witchy folklore stuff, um, which feels like a kind of new dark direction and yeah. Ooh, can't, can't wait to kind of really get stuck in. <laughs> Sign me up. Uh, that sounds amazing. Um, and uh, Catherine would like to know what are a few of your favorite books, and do you have um, some favorite contemporary authors of thriller novels or anything else? Oh yes. So, uh, favorite contemporary novels would be um, well. Favorite contemporary authors would be. Um, I mean a lot. Obviously you, Laura, should say you first of all, because a huge fan. Um, they're all, they're mainly all women actually. Um, so Laura, um, Ellie Griffiths, uh, I don't know if you've read any of her work, she has this brilliant series, uh, the Ruth Gallery series. Um, uh, she's a forensic archaeologist, so there's always like a cold case, a sort of sometimes centuries or millennia old cold case alongside a kind of more modern murder mystery. Um, I love Louise Candlish. Um, she writes kind of brilliant sort of domestic, I think she calls it criblet because it's often kind of people's houses and sort of their, their attachment to their houses and their neighbors and that's wonderful um I love uh Ruth Ware um uh really excitingly we're doing an event together soon um gosh so many so many different female authors um I can mention um Erin Kelly is another great British thriller writer wonderful kind of psychological thrillers and then my sort of holy trinity of kind of more vintage ladies um, would be Agatha Christie, uh, Daphne du Maurier and Patricia Highsmith. And they're, they're the sort of ones that I invoke, you know, when I'm writing. Um, That's amazing. I just actually started Strangers on a Train um, the other night because I, it's so, f I, when I, I went to my local bookstore and I told them how much I love the Paris apartment of which, <laughs> you know, they were already, had so many coming in, but I'm like, this one is amazing. And no, you cannot have my galley. Um, but they, um, uh, and they're like, well, we'll get our own. Um, but the, um, uh, they actually, I said, I need books like this. And they, one of the booksellers there who I love, Lynn gave me strangers on a train. So, um, it's so good. Um, I, really yeah, good. I think I, I sort of, it's Agatha Christie for plot. Um, Daphne du Maurier for kind of atmosphere, like gothic atmosphere, and Patricia Highsmith just for characterization and for kind of writing those characters that you sort of love to hate and you also find yourself really uncomfortably 
empathizing with so like you want Tom Ripley to get away with it and it's and it's <laughs> awful because he's sort of a psychopath he's a yeah. sociopath a psychopath and yet you don't want him to get caught which is just so uncomfortable yeah oh, I can see someone saying Erin Erin Kelly um oh. brilliant <laughs> um um I want to know also what do you come up with well and a reader wants to know um when do you come up with your title because your titles are so great Oh, so difficult. Um, I mean, it's always a bit of a process. Funny enough, with the hunting party, that actually came to me really quickly. And it was a sort of title that we almost jotted down. And we were like, it's probably not right, but we'll come back to it later. And it just ended up feeling right for that book. And it never changed. So that was probably the easiest title journey I've ever had. The guest list so hard. We went back and forth with like the wedding guest, the wedding list or whatever. And um, it's really interesting, I think. Well, I find it really interesting from sort of geeky publishing point of view, but um, the US and the UK often have different ideas about what they want in the title. So in the US, they were really keen to have wedding in the title. Mm -hmm. And in the UK, they were like over our dead body. Like we cannot have that. We cannot. So, so that was that was a kind of interesting one, and then the guest list just felt right. Um, and with the Paris apartment, I I think as the writer, you're almost worst place sometimes to to sort of pick the title because you want it to encompass everything that the book is to you in the same way that you want the cover to sort of represent everything that the book is. Um, so I had all these like very clever like kind of Frenchy titles that I thought were sort of, and they were all way too sort of strange and obscure and subtle so I had things like Le Petit Mour and stuff like that and my publishers <laughs> no we're gonna so yeah so it was, it was a long process and actually a bit of a a kind of group think um discussion on this one but but I'm really pleased we got to we got to where we got to um and then um for one last question and then I'm gonna ask one last one last for the from the group was um have you ever um thought about doing something in the future will you be doing something in the future that's not a thriller are you pretty much thinking about thrillers for the moment I mean I'm absolutely loving writing them and I feel like I've still got a, a lot that I want to say and a lot of sort of different themes I want to explore um and it's just such fun that said I I definitely think when I'm writing, I, I come to those books as a reader. So I always try and write the book that I would want to read. And I read really widely. I read in kind of lots of different genres. Um, I think as a reader, I don't really think about genre. I just want a really good yarn with great characterization. Um, so I would never say never. I mean, I wrote three historicals before I kind of moved into thrillers and I love doing that. Um, and I have a kind of, I have a little idea for a sort of, it's not sci-fi, but it's sort of, I'm just, just saying this here so that I have to write it, a sort of yes. five seconds in the future, I think it's called. But it's sort of a little bit Black Mirror-y. Um, that could be fun to talk one day. <laughs> oh, that sounds amazing. And then my, my last question um, uh, is always just because when I sit and write, I always have to have my cup of coffee with me. Is there something that's in your writing ritual that you like must have, must it be at a certain, doesn't sound like it has to be at a certain spot or maybe it's a certain time of day or something that you eat or drink that you have to have with you or you like to have with you that makes the writing go better? I mean, a lot of coffee, like a good coffee um, and my notebook. I love, like my, I'm never happier. I think my happiest moment as a, as a writer is just sitting in a great coffee shop, um, a great coffee or tap with my notebook, just sort of writing that first draft because it feels so like free and messy and you know you're making loads of mistakes that you'll have to kind of come back to later and sort out in the editing process. Um, but it's just so kind of joyful. I don't know if you find that, that kind of yeah. first draft is just like, oh, um, it's so funny because I've never actually spoken with another writer whose writing process is so similar. Like every, when you're, is when it? you're it's really, and, and also I feel that same stress sometimes when I talk to other writers that I'm like, I'm doing this wrong. So this makes me feel a lot. I love the freedom of that be, uh, in the pre quarantine COVID world, coffee shop was my favorite place. Oh, yeah. It sounds like your first draft is handwritten. Is that largely handwritten because that sort of stops me from getting too distracted and checking my emails too much and yeah. and it also it feels a lot freer because you know I can just get stuff down on the page and I don't have to kind of worry too much about getting exactly the right word or kind of you know I know I can sort of 
when I come to type it up, I'm almost editing for the first time. Literally, that's the kind of second draft almost when it goes onto my laptop. So I know I can kind of come back to it then. It just feels very kind of flowing and free. Um, sometimes though, I lose notebooks um, or I can't read my own handwriting. So it's definitely not like a foolproof. <laughs> Do you type or are you? <laughs> but the, the best, uh, my mother made me take a, like a typing class in high school. Amazing. Yeah. So I was complaining and that her, her idea was I could always get a job if I could type, you know, mm -hmm. but so now I, I can type and my handwriting is atrocious, but I have the same thing of going to a coffee shop very free flowing that first draft. So, um, well, this has been such a treat. Um, I, I, I mean, this book is just, it's, you will read it in one night. So just uh, my one suggestion would be read it, start it on a night where you don't have to get up very early the next morning. <laughs> so, um, and this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much for interviewing your brilliant questions. Thank you everyone for joining us. Um, thank you to Barnes and Noble and thanks for tuning in. I, I kind of feel like I should acknowledge this sitting here in Europe. Um, you know, it's been a weird day. Um, there's some kind of really nasty stuff happening out there in the world. And, and so thank you for tuning in when there are kind of much more important things going on and just kind of escaping into a talk about books. And um, I've just, I've kind of loved it. So thank you.